Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. Today's episode is The Problem with Zoos. Before we begin, my name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com and on social media. You can find my books wherever books are sold, and you can join me in my online cooking classes or my vegan trips around the world. And thank you to everyone who makes this podcast possible. Food for Thought is 100% listener supported and I need your help. (laughs) If you are getting any value out of the work that I do here on this podcast, on social media, in all the ways that I try and empower people to live according to their own values of compassion and wellness, then please become a supporter at Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau, and you can pick whatever level works for you. You get different perks at different levels. And thank you so much in advance. Thank you also for listening to this podcast and for subscribing. Hi, everyone. This is going to be a short episode. I am fostering kitties again, and I always think I can keep my regular schedule and not have my bandwidth and time affected when I bring these little beings into my life, but I'm always mistaken. Obviously, when something this intense comes in, something as intense as being responsible for two little lives... Uh, in addition to everything else I'm trying to keep together, including taking care of my own cats, uh, other things just inevitably drop. And I'm not going to lie, it's stressful. um, And I'm doing the best I can. I don't like when I can't keep my regular schedule. I don't like when I have a longer time span between podcast episodes. But balls are getting dropped. It's okay. I know you're okay with it. So Thank you for your patience. But here I am with a new episode uh, that is a short answer to a question I get often, which is what is wrong with zoos? And if they're promoting conservation, which a lot of zoos say they are, isn't that a good thing? So that's the question, or those are the questions I'm going to answer. And in answer to the questions a lot of you ask me on social media about the cats I'm fostering, there was an organization I was working with uh, doing direct rescue and, and socializing cats and fostering cats, Maine Coon Adoptions, and they did retire, it's true. Uh, the volunteers from that organization formed a new coalition, a new network called Uh, Adoptable Rescue Cats in California. So ARC is the acronym. And they're still working with the rescue partners to rescue cats, get them adopted. And so I fell into this. I didn't expect to be fostering so soon. I'm probably going to be working with them in other areas, but not necessarily fostering just because I love it. It's just intense. (laughs) It's emotional and it's rewarding and it's intense. And I do have a podcast episode on fostering both dogs and cats if you want to listen to that. But these two sisters are amazing. Their names are Hazel and Henrietta. Henrietta was on the Shire side. She's been here almost three weeks and she's doing so fabulously well. In fact, two and a half weeks and she's doing great. And uh, and yeah, we'll see. So if you're interested or know someone who's interested in adopting a bonded pair, they're about a year old, they're super affectionate and loving and playful and they've got kitten energy, but they also are really chill. In fact, they finally calmed down and right now they're sleeping. One of them is sleeping on my sweater that I put on the floor for her <laughs> because because that's what cats do. If you put a tiny piece of, piece of paper down, they will sit on that piece of paper. And you also ask me a lot about how my cats handle it. I keep my foster cats separate. So they're in my office, which means I spend a lot of time in here doing my work. And, um, and it keeps my cats separate completely. But Charlie and Michiko are doing fine. Everybody's fine. Everybody's good. But do reach out to me if you know of anyone who wants to adopt these two fabulous girls. I can point you to the the uh, the ad for them on the website and the application for adoption. So before I get to the heart of this episode, I want to also announce with great joy that our October Tuscany trip has sold out. And we have changed the name of my trips from CPG Vegan Trips. CPG is my name, Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Um, But that was always an insider kind of name for the trips. And it just really, I don't think, was the best best name for marketing purposes. (laughs) Most people don't know what CPG stands for. So they're just Joyful Vegan Trips, which makes the most sense. Uh, So you can always find the trips at joyfulvegantrips.com. And if you forget and you go to CPG Trips, it'll redirect you to joyfulvegantrips.com. So Joyful Vegan Trips 
easy to remember. All that's to say is our trips are back. Take that COVID. Oh, it feels really good to be talking about these trips. And while our joyful vegan trip to Cape Town and Botswana has also been filled, that's in December this year, my travel partners at World Vegan Travel do have spots in their Cape Town Botswana trip that immediately follows mine. So ours are the CP, the CPGC, I did it too. It's going to take some time. The joyful vegan trip to Botswana is in uh, December. At, this is 2021. And the World Vegan Travel trip starts right after that and goes into New Year's. So it's over New Year's. And it's Cape Town, it's Botswana. And I have been in Botswana during New Year's. And I can tell you, it's a very special way to ring in the New Year. <laughs> so so if you missed out on the Joyful Vegan Botswana, you can join my dear, dear partners at World Vegan Travel. So if you just go to Joyful Vegan Trips, you'll see the World Vegan Travel uh, link to their Botswana trip, and you can inquire about that and sign up for it and reserve your spot. Now, come 2022, we do have more incredible trips for you. The ones that are already available right now, there is a our first North American trip. Again, all of these trips are by, you know, popular demand. What, you tell me what you're interested in and we make it happen. So a lot of people are asking for a North American trip. So we have an incredible winter wonderland getaway to Whistler, British Columbia, and that's in February of 2022. And we're going back to Rwanda. Our November 2022 trip, which is a year and a half away at this recording, is already filling up and it truly is a trip of a lifetime. We bumped things up. The five-star hotels we're staying in are off the hook. We also have other trips planned um, or that we're planning for. They require more work and scouting and and details, but uh, before they can go live, including Japan and Northern Italy. The point is keep checking out joyfulvegantrips.com so you don't miss out, but you can right now get on the Rwanda trip. There's only, you know, 20 people. So 23 people, 24 people. So that's it. And once that fills up, I don't know when we're going back to Rwanda again. So it's, a, it's, it's an incredible trip and I, and I encourage you to check it out. So joyfulvegantrips.com. What is wrong with zoos. Zoos promote conservation of animals and endangered species. Isn't that a good thing? I've often said that in a way, I think that things would probably be better for animals if we were less captivated by them in a strange, contradictory way, of course. Our fascination with them, even our appreciation for them, is often what causes us to harm them the most. Let me explain. We're so attracted to their beauty that we adorn ourselves with their skin and their feathers and their fur. We're so moved by their intelligence that we force them to perform for us. Look at them. That's amazing <laughs> because they're so smart. We're so covetous of their strength that we seek to assimilate it by consuming and ingesting their bits and parts. We're so intrigued by their very presence that we confine and display them just so we can gawk, observing with amazement how much like us they actually are. Exhibiting animals, particularly large, wild, quote unquote, exotic animals, goes back as far as ancient times. They were called menageries. And these menageries, precursors of modern zoos, tended to be owned by the wealthy whose human supremacy and wealth and power could be displayed along with their animal collections. That's what they were there for. Not much has changed, <laughs> except perhaps in the modern way that we shroud the ugliness of animal captivity in the guise of science and conservation. When menageries were a thing, and they still are in some places by some very wealthy people, they weren't trying to say they were anything other than look at what I have, look at what I've obtained, look at what I can display. Now we shroud the ugliness of animal captivity in the guise of science and conservation. Zoos celebrate their breeding programs as a means to propagate endangered species. We've all heard that. And you can go now to so many different websites and zoos, zoos websites and the zoos themselves, and they will talk about their conservation programs. It's kind of now what zoos are calling themselves because public relations wise, it's better and the public is more oriented to that than simply to 
um, displaying animals. So they, they celebrate their breeding programs as a means to propagate endangered species, but I have to ask to what end? Not a single lowland gorilla or mountain gorilla, or for that matter, black rhino or elephant or orangutan, all of whom are classified as critically endangered, has ever gone from a zoo back into the wild. Has, it just hasn't, doesn't happen. <laughs> there is no record of any of these animals going from a U.S. zoo back into the wild. Zoos populate zoos, not the wild. Breeding programs replenish cages, not the wild. For captive breeding programs to be successful, and I, I'm not opposed to some, some of them are successful in the sense that they are breeding these animals, but in order for them to be successful truly, wild habitats must be preserved. The dollars spent by the public and by zoos on animal exhibits would be better spent on protecting already wild individuals and rapidly disappearing habitats. Rewilding is an example of something that we could and should be investing in more. I just imagine someday that we will have only exhibits of wild animals because we will have done away with all of the wild spaces. That's not what we want for ourselves or for them or for our future. More than that, thousands of animals in zoos are betrayed by their alleged champions every year to curb overpopulation. Animals are killed on a regular basis in zoos around the world, either to be fed to other captive animals or to zoo patrons in some cases. Now, if they're not killed, these are called surplus animals. Those individuals, those, are that, those who are considered surplus, these are individuals that zoos no longer uh, consider profitable because they're neither young enough nor cute enough to attract crowds. They wind up in circuses if they're not killed or private residences, even sometimes in the hands of taxidermists. There was a two-year investigation by the San Jose Mercury News and it found that 38% of the mammals bred in acc accredited zoos, accredited zoos, were sold to dealers, auctions, hunting ranches, and roadside zoos. These were accredited zoos and they're sold because there is an overpopulation of these animals. They are surplus animals. Now, in addition to celebrating their breeding programs and their conservation programs, zoos also emphasize their role in educating the public about wildlife, instilling a love of animals, fostering appreciation for the natural world, though evidence suggests the opposite. Evidence suggests, and there is a lot of evidence, there have been a lot of surveys and studies, suggest that zoos do not in fact increase our knowledge or understanding of either animals or nature. And one of the reasons is that zoo animals do not exhibit natural behaviors in captivity. What they exhibit instead are neurotic behaviors, uh, sometimes repetitive rituals such as pacing and bar biting and swaying and circling, right? No matter how much zoos design their enclosures to mimic their respective natural habitats, they're not their natural habitats. And they know that. So not only is captivity not beneficial for the prisoners, it instills nothing in us but arrogance and supremacy and apathy, perpetuating the idea that non-human animals are here for us to use and us to abuse and us to exploit for our own pleasures and purposes. Not so when we admire birds in our backyards at the bird feeder or at the bird bath, right? Or if we watch bees pollinate flowers, or we spot wild turkeys, or deer, or chipmunks, or squirrels, or lizards from a hiking trail, we can be captivated by animals without holding them captive. It's not that we should find animals less fascinating, or less beautiful, or impressive. It's not that we should appreciate animals less. What we need to do is appreciate more that animals' inherent desire for freedom, for life, for autonomy, and for self-determination is as strong as our own. That in these ways, they are indeed just like us. We don't need to change our admiration for non-human animals as much as we need to change our understanding of how non-human animals see themselves. If that were the lens through which we looked, we would be as outraged at the mere existence of zoos as we are by those who suggest they should be abolished for the animals 
This is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening.